I told them this morning when I arrived, they gave me one of the fancy headsets. I said, I've got to use microphone BP3. That is the, that is the uh, pandemic microphone that I used in this space. And so I'm a creature of nostalgia, so I had to wear that this morning. Well, let me just say here at the very beginning of this thing how strange it is to preach with people in this room. I mean, that's an adjustment in and of itself. Um, people in it, it's amazing. What a novel idea. Uh, last year during our live stream partnership, uh, our worshipers uh, in this space, really what we had were the guys in the sound booth. Um, they were good communicators. We learned to read their language. You would get a go time or you'd get a thumbs up, meaning we can hear you. And so uh, it was great getting to know uh, the hard workers up there in the sound booth. It's good to see you again, guys. And thanks for always helping me sound good here. Um, yeah, what, an, what a year. What a year. So imagine the feeling that first Sunday uh, I preached during our joint partnership and the sanctuary was missing you. It was missing you. It's a wild time to not only be the church, uh, but last year, these last 20 months have been a really hard time to just be a human being in general, has it not? Trying to figure things out, trying to figure out what is life supposed to be with face masks and, and physical distancing, vaccines, the conversations, the politics of it all. It has been brutal, I think. Very, very brutal. I think it's also very important um, that I acknowledge how strange it is for me to just be here this morning. Um, it is a strange process we go through as pastors uh, to be called to different congregations to begin those conversations. Um, I just want to be very upfront with you all that this has not been easy. I'm extremely grateful for the search committee and their patience with me as I carefully discerned I'm grateful for my brother, Pete Contra, our district executive, um, who has a full plate as it is, um, and his, uh, his helpfulness during this time as I ask many questions. Um, and so I do know that there are folks from my current congregation who will likely be hearing this later. Um, and I just want to make it clear that uh, they have all been in my thoughts and in my prayers as we've discerned this pivotal moment. It's just something that I think needs to be said. God presented me with a few potential paths and opportunities this summer. Uh, and after I had those conversations and walked through a few of those doors, I am certain, however, that this is where I'm supposed to be on this morning. And you all are the folks I'm called to be with this morning as well. Uh, now, I want to tell some irony here, if I can. Uh, my first year at the seminary, I remember having a conversation with a couple of students. Now, I was still learning the Church of the Brethren, but uh, E-Town was quite legendary uh, around tables at the seminary. I especially knew Pam Rice. I mean, the joke was is that she's my brethren crush. Um, and so I just, I just love her, right? Uh, and I remember saying uh, to the group, I said, you know, one goal that I have is I want to preach to the E-Town congregation at least once and maybe do something uh, to collaborate with Pam Rice at least once. And of course, I've since gotten to know Josh Tendall, which in the Church of the Brethren, there is no one like him. Uh, he goes unmatched in this denomination as far as musical gifts, uh, his diversity in musical styles. And then of course, getting to know Pastor Jason. Well, Jason and I have known each other for a good long while. And uh, so I, I say all of that in saying, God's pretty funny sometimes, um, that the first time I did get to preach to the E-Town Church, you all weren't here, but we are here now. <laughs> we are here now. And so I was reflecting on that story uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and I say all of this because of the reputation of this church. Um, I hope that you all know the impact you make both here locally within the Atlantic Northeast District, but then to the denomination at large. Uh, it's no small thing, the conversations you've had, the heavy lifting you've done, and I'm sure some of the pain you've even endured as you have followed God's call and leading. Um, your call and leadership in practicing peace, service, and openness to all, that's not just a catchy phrase. 
It's not just a tagline for the pastors to throw out every Sunday morning. It is who you are, and it is what you're doing. Um, That's what I've learned about this congregation, especially in the last 20 months. I also want to apologize for my sudden disappearance. (laughs) I know that, you know, we were here together every Sunday, and then things opened back up at Lidditz. We were meeting in person. It was just suddenly as if I had vanished. We did talk about that a little bit after the fact. Um, But uh, again, I couldn't have made it through the pandemic, uh, and especially during those earliest months uh, pre-vaccine without the work of of these three and and also Pastor Greg. Um, I think we helped each other get through it in that time. Um, so yeah, your reputation, your leaders and pastors, both uh, past and present, so, I mean, they are icons, and someone recently said uh, legends uh, to me as we were talking about the folks that come from this congregation. Uh, you all have served as role models to a lot of people in our faith tradition, and based on a few things I've heard, uh, I wouldn't be surprised, too, as if in your leadership, uh, some of the pictures of your pastors aren't on folks' dartboards and basements because they are holy troublemakers, <laughs> right? <laughs> I say this mostly in jest, right? But this is a congregation that knows the cost uh, and the all too real pain of following the lead of one who took a great deal of heat from an angry mob. Uh, The gospel message is not one that is easy. It's not one that's cheap or just easily done and walked and lived. Uh, It takes a community like this one to see it through. It takes leaders like you all to make it happen. Um, This is pretty evident to me, especially too when Pastor Pam said during a Zoom meeting last year uh, that she chooses not to discriminate against anyone, but she chooses to love them and serve them with her whole heart. She means that. I think we all deeply felt that on our Zoom call together. When the people that choose discrimination and choose to serve the outdated, unethical, and degrading forms of ordering society are angry, and they're angry at you, that means you're on message, church. I'm going to read from a part of one of the most transformational texts that I would say has ever been written in history. A text that takes human society and structure and infuses it with a code of heaven-sent ethics. This is from the Sermon on the Mount, which begins in Matthew chapter 5. Here Jesus is dramatically reordering the human way of existing uh, that will not ever lead to death but rather to transformative life. Jesus is saying these things to the ones who will most readily perceive and live into the kingdom of God. Now, before I read that, though, I do want to say that we are all too used to hearing from the powers and principalities a different set of beatitudes, a different set of blessings. They say, blessed are you, the mighty in zeal, the strong arm the bigger of the dogs in a dog-eat-dog world. Blessed are you, war makers, those who drive the tanks and drop the biggest bombs. And blessed are you, the proud and the arrogant, the self-sure, unforgiving bullies. No one will ever mess with you in this world and in this life. Blessed are those who never get caught when their easy life comes at the cost of stepping on some other poor, unknown sucker. They are the ones who get to draw the lines on the map. We're too used to hearing those kinds of blessings. Where strength and violence is rewarded. But we're here because we believe in something entirely different. But imagine if we perceive life and humanity and the way we structure those things in different ways. Imagine hearing, blessed are the poor in spirit those who mourn, those who are meek, the merciful, not the war maker, but the peace maker. Blessed are you when they come after you in your honest pursuit of this transformational life. And I think you've felt that, haven't you? Blessed are you when they come after you in your honest pursuit of this kind of transformational life. 
So here is my scripture reading this morning. And this will be what I want to say to you all. Then he said, You, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how will it be made salty again? It is good for nothing except to be thrown away and trampled under people's feet. You, you, you are a light in the world, a city on top of a hill that can never be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on top of a lamp stand and it shines on all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people so they can see the good things you do and praise the one who is in heaven. That's what he said. So what do I have to say to this church this morning as your pastoral candidate? It's this. I believe that now more than ever, we need congregations that serve and live as role models for this wild, imaginative, hopeful, and inclusive, and also expansive and expanding world that Jesus is working to create. We need role models. We need waymakers. I believe that we, now more than ever, need communities of faith that are willing to do whatever it takes to work with God in the transformative and life-giving message of the gospel, the things he said. And I believe that we, now more than ever, need communities that, much like salt, add flavor and goodness to the world and to the neighbors and the neighborhoods that are around us. And I have often wondered, has Christianity just lost its saltiness? It doesn't add much to life for a lot of people. There's no flavor there or craving. No one seems to have any need to say again, please pass the salt. In fact, the salt has been deemed bad for you, unhelpful. Maybe Christianity has taken the light of the world and tucked it away and only used for private use. A source of self-indignant comfort, perhaps. I've needed to reclaim my own saltiness and light over these last 20 months. Especially during this pandemic, I have learned so much about myself and I've learned a lot about others. The pandemic has revealed the best parts of many of us. In the same vein, it has also revealed some of the not so great parts of all of us and others. Now, one thing I remember saying to the search team during our lengthy time together was that I had a moment of realization that I could be myself fully when I was here on the live stream. And I realized I needed that for me, for my family, and honestly for the church. I needed a place where I could be who I am, to say the things that I feel called and led to say, and to stand with those with whom I feel called and led to stand with. A place where Eric can be Eric. I mean, why else would I wear a bright yellow dinosaur bow tie on a candidate weekend? <laughs> there was a point to that. And when I picked it out, I had some questions. But the point is, is 
I'm here and I'm wearing it. And I am being who I am. I said today to Heather as we were driving here that if I am anything else today, if I'm nothing else, I want to be honest. I want to be true to who I am. Because you need to know that just as I need to know who you are. And so if we are going to do this thing together, it is going to take relationship. It is going to be perhaps disagreeing sometimes. That stuff happens. But if we keep these relationships strong, and if we keep ourselves close to one another, we can have those kinds of conversations. A lot of you are wondering in a time when you're here calling a new pastor today, many of us, we don't even know what the church is going to look like two, three, four, five years from now, or even a month. What is the line between in person and online? How do we navigate that? How do we face it together? One thing I remember hearing someone say was that the, the E-Town and Lidditz partnership live stream was one of the best live streams out there. And we were, we were like the Brethren Mega Church. Now, Brethren Mega Church is a very different meaning than some other denominations, but <laughs> we were. I and mean, we had folks tuning in from all over. We were getting letters. We were getting questions. We were receiving encouragement because we were having some hard conversations as a church, and that's what this is to be about. This is how we figure out life together. This isn't where we come and punch our attendance card and then just pray Jesus will get us into heaven one day. This is how we figure out life in the here and now. We are the new ordering of human society that Jesus is establishing. That's the church. The message and invitation to practice peace, service, and an openness to every single person puts this church and even our denomination, honestly, in a great place to change who we are and the world around us for the better. I think the message the Church of the Brethren bears is one that is needed. People are tired of the anger and the frustration and the bickering and the fighting and they need a message of community and hope and dignity towards each other. That's what we're about. We are a historic peace church, after all. But we need to remember that. A quick story that I'll tell you was a, a NOAC. Yes, I went to NOAC, National Older Adult Conference. I was on the bus with a lot of people from this church. And they had Joan Chittister speaking that... Um, that year and she is a prolific sister um, I mean she is amazing she's written so many books she's highly respected in the peace community and she said you know when I got the call she has an agent she's a big deal when I got the call from my agent that the Church of the Brethren wants you to speak at their National Older Adult Conference she said my normal response when I'm writing a book is to say no because I'm busy writing she says but when I heard it was the Church of the Brethren I said, tell them I'll be there. And she said, the reason she's so fond of our, of our, of our church, of our denomination, she said, during the height of the Vietnam War, they were all in D.C. and they were protesting the violence and the war itself. And they were out in front of the Capitol building. They were singing their hymns and speaking on peace. And the police would show up to arrest them. <laughs> Imagine arresting a bunch of nuns. Like, that's, a, that's an image. But she said when the police would arrive, a group of people would show up and they would surround them and they would link arms so that they could keep singing and speaking of peace and the police couldn't get to them. And she said the group that showed up was the Church of the Brethren. She said, so whenever I get a call from you all as that historic peace church committed to these things, I say yes because peace is just who you are. And then she paused for an uncomfortable amount of time. And she said, right? Right? Or, or have you forgotten? It is who we are. It is what we practice. 
It's written into our code. It's etched into our pews. It's sung in our music. It's lived out in the streets through service projects. Peace is who we are. Peacemakers are what we become. A few things to know about me as a person and especially as a pastor. I promise I'm not going 45 minutes. I'm, I'm wrapping up here. I'm a big dreamer. I mean, pretty big, right, Heather? <laughs> a big dreamer. I thrive in places where I can feel free to think big thoughts, dream massive dreams, and take risk of doing things that have a real and lasting impact on people around me on real and lasting impact on people around us. And the church is changing every single day and it will require a great deal of creativity and ideas to do new and exciting things. And this will require seeing things from a different perspective and differing perspectives. It will call us away from our places of comfort and time-tested understandings of the world and of life itself. I have felt this call in my life. And here I am. Here I am willing to go where God will lead and send all of us. And so the question that I have for you is this. Will you go with me?